What is the role of religion in our ever-changing world? From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Issues of Faith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Issues of Faith. Glad you're with us. We are talking today about an urgent call to biblical unity. Our guest is Anthony Hendricks, director of the Center for Biblical Unity at Williamson College. And coming up in September, you're going to be leading a 10-week class that discusses race, injustice, and social action. Yes. This is, this is open to the public mm -hmm. uh, for a fee, but I really want to drill down into what, what you're discussing. Okay. Why is this discussion so important right now? Well, I'm, yeah, it's important right now, but it was important before our country became so divided, right? Um, yeah, I think we have, because of the, um, the start, the beginning of our country and how the DNA has been infused into our country, we've always been at odds with one another. And so, um, but the, the purpose and the reason that this is so important, um, not just now, but it has been, is because it is a biblical mandate. And as a believer, um, and, and, and being in a town that um, is, is supposedly Christian town, um, you know, it is my belief that Jesus desires that his body unify. Um, and he desires that it unifies because um, we, we read in John 17, as Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, he prayed for unity. Um, he prayed that the body would come together so that the world might know that God loves them and that he sent Jesus for them. And so Jesus in some kind of uh, unique way tied the gospel message to this thing called unity. And I think that the body of Christ has failed tremendously in this country at this thing, which is the reason why we see our culture at, at odds with one another, because this, this, this group of people, this body of believers who have been given a ministry of reconciliation have failed, in my opinion. You think we failed. Um, and, and it's not a failing of the last couple of years. You think it's a failing that goes back oh, for absolutely. a long time. Absolutely. And yeah. is it, are we failing worse? Are we getting any worse? Are we getting any better? I mean, there have been, there have been strides toward this over the years. And I believe over, throughout the country, there are movements of multi-ethnic churches that, have, that are really attempting to do what Jesus calls us to do. Um, but I think what we have seen is over the years, uh, this racial tension has kind of, kind of hovered below the surface. And I think that because of the last two administrations that have come into office, in the presidential office, it has unearthed a lot of stuff, even in believers, which is, it's a tragedy to me, but it, is, it, it exists, it's in our DNA. And so until we not only come to Christ uh, for salvation, but until we allow Jesus to get to that part of our hearts that still holds on to some of those racial biases, I don't think we're going to get any further. But we have made strides. I mean, there have been strides that have been um, made in our country. I just think we we had a long way to go. It's been said many times the most segregated hour is that hour <clears throat> on Sundays of worship. And some people say, okay, <clears throat> that's a real problem. Some people say it's not a real problem. What, what, what do you think, the fact that that is, if it's true, the most segregated hour? It's an absolute problem, in my opinion. Um, you know, the body of Christ, the church, uh, the universal church, is probably the largest and yet most segregated institution left in this country, right? And again, we've been given this ministry of reconciliation, so some kind of way we've lost it, right? And so, um, but Sunday mornings, it is still the most segregated hour of the week. And it's because of um, a historical issue that began with um, the white church not allowing us to worship with them, or even if we were in the same building, we would have to sit up in the balcony. Um, and so because of that, uh, two gentlemen um, back in the 1800s decided that they're gonna start the first African-American denomination, and that's the AME Church. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people ask, well, why do we have a black church and a white church? Well, it's because we had to create something where we could worship and not feel the, the, the tension of racism um, while we worshiped. And you say 
It will take a transformative intentionality. Yeah. So this doesn't happen without hard work, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think people go to church where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I would think a lot of people would say, I'm, I'm not going to this church or that church because I don't like this person or that person. Mm -hmm. It's just where I feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But do you think we need to move outside of that? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that um, I speak about often is if we're going to exist in this body of unity, um, we've got to become comfortable with being uncomfortable um, because that's just the nature of cultural differences, right? I may like a certain type of music, you may not. And so in, um, in a church that I used to pastor, we would always tell our folks, you know, if your music's not being played this Sunday, then thank God that your brother or your sister is hearing their music this Sunday. And you know what, you may even get to like that other kind of music. And I think that happened. And so um, as we continue to mix the music of worship, um, all of our members began to appreciate all styles of worship music. Um, but it is, it's a very uncomfortable thing. And so I because, just, yeah, something like music is uncomfortable. Yeah. And this is bigger than music. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see real disagreements mm -hmm. over music. Yeah. And this oh, yeah. is bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've got to move. It's, it's, inten it's transformative intentionality. We've yeah. got to be really intentional about mm -hmm. what we're doing. Yeah, you do. You and do. How, how do we do that? Well, you know, w one of the things that I encourage um, all believers, but white believers in particular, and the reason I say that is it's not because I have something against white believers, but because of your place of privilege, there are a lot of things that you've, you've just not had to know about what's going on in this country racially. Um, your privilege keeps you away from that. I often, I, I read a book uh, last year and the author said, the definition of white privilege is the ability to walk away. So if you don't like something that's going on, your privilege just allows you to just be done with it. Um, we don't have that. We've never had that privilege. And so, um, so that's the reason why I say one of the things that I talk to my white believers about is, you know, you first have to make yourself aware. You've got to be intentional about doing some research, reading some different books that you didn't read growing up, um, being open to the facts behind the true history of this country and how that affects even what's going on today. Um, you know, we hear from some of our um, our congressman that, you know, well, that happened years ago. Yeah, it did happen years ago, but what happened years ago still affects what's going on today. And until we understand what happened, why it happened, and begin to deal with that, um, then it, it's, it's just going to continue down the same road. And so the intentionality is you must first make yourself aware. Like, what is going on? What, like, what is this race issue? Why is everybody continuing to talk about this? So, um, you know, in our class, we're going to hand out um, a list of resources, books that our people can read and, um, and make themselves aware of this issue. But then I think from uh, moving from the uh, making yourself aware is now I need to develop some relationships and I've got to be intentional about doing that. And that's hard because, you know, I have a friend who is on his, his racial reconciliation journey and, um, and he came to me a couple weeks ago and he said, man, you know, I tried to develop a relationship with this guy, this African-American guy, and I just felt like he just didn't want to be bothered with me. Just, and I said, man, you know what? Unfortunately, that's going to be the case in a lot of these. Because what, you, what, what, what we don't understand is sometimes African-Americans aren't on their own journey, right? So we'd rather, some of us rather would stay separate, um, stay angry, um, not trust, um, and so when you come and you're like, man, I, you know, can we hang out? Some people will say, no, nah, I don't necessarily need that. <laughs> and so, so that's, what, that's what you call this, a journey. It is. And, and you're encouraging people um, of all races mm -hmm. to, to step out of their comfort zone and go on this, this journey. Mm -hmm. Part of that journey is understanding the past. Yes. Because people will say, oh, that was, that was years ago, mm -hmm. and that's, that's not me, mm -hmm. and, and I guess to some extent that's true, but mm -hmm. it's helped us get to where we are, Absolutely. and we need to understand that. Yeah. And so is that, is that what you would say? This is a journey, and people need it to is. just be thinking about that? Yeah, it is a journey on what I call the racial continuum. And so there are some people on the far left of the continuum that are like, man, this is not an issue, I don't know why you guys are talking about this. And then there are others on the right hand side who are really in it and promoting racial unity. 
And then you have all sorts of people in, uh, on in any point on that continuum that are, maybe they've begun their journey, maybe they're right in the middle, maybe they're heading toward that place where, man, I not only get this, but I am now promoting, I am encouraging this with my family members, with my coworkers, and so forth. So it is a journey. And it's important for those of us who are in um, positions of leadership or teaching to understand that there are, there are different places on this continuum that people might be on. And you can't press somebody who kind of just jumped on the continuum to be like, come on, man, get it together. You gotta gently kind of direct them toward new resources and intentionality where, you know, if they're just starting, man, all of this stuff is just mind blowing. It's like for a lot of my white brothers and sisters who are just starting the continuum, they're just kind of like, man, I just never knew any of this. I just never, I've never seen it. And so um, some part of that intentionality is um, extending enough grace to folks to allow them to jump on the continuum and to kind of make their own mistakes and, you know, um, just kind of start the journey because it is it's a it's a journey and it's a long journey and it's hard it and is. one of the things that you write here in the abstract the mm -hmm. sad truth regarding race and racism is that the white church's complicity and involvement in racial injustice played a huge role in its existence and subsequent maturation mm -hmm. that that's that's rough it is um, but y you can back this up oh absolutely yeah, yeah there there is there is much documentation um, that um, that lends itself to that statement that I made in my abstract. It's hard though, like you said, like I, you know, as I've been reading, um, preparing for my class, you know, I've had some of my theological giants that I've learned that were slave owners. And I'm like, I'm, and so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand that, like how, how God can they write such deep theological truths but yet, right out in their backyard, they have these human beings made in your likeness and in your image, God, that they're subjugating to free labor. I, so, it, you know, when you say it's difficult, it's not just difficult for everybody out there. It's difficult for me as I'm reading and I'm studying and I'm learning some things about men that I held in high regard. And if anything, I think what it's done is it's just reminded me that they're just men. And they're just as flawed as everybody else. God has given them a special gift to write some pretty heavy theological books. But then it also was hard because when you, when you learn what else was going on, then you start to think, well, how much of what they believed about this influences what they wrote about theology? And so then you start questioning some of what they've written over here. So it, it's, it's it, man, it is, it's interesting, and uh, if, you don't, if you're not careful, you can allow yourselves to go a little too far down that road, and then you start distrusting everybody. And I think where I have, I have um, arrived is, man, we're all flawed, um, but in the midst of our failures and our flaws, God still uses us and, and uses us to impact others. And so a lot of times, man, God just puts a mirror in front of me and says, okay, you know, you, you're out here teaching, and this, but what, what's your mess, right? And so, um, so yeah, it, it is a difficult journey. And I think that's why um, some people just say, man, I, I, can't, I can't do it. It can be tough. But, but the positive thing in the face of what is a difficult journey and a difficult time is that the church can play a role. And so mm -hmm. I wanna talk more about that. Mm -hmm. But we'll take a break, yeah. uh, take a break. Be back right after this.